welcome everybody. Thank you. Exactly. And that force of nature, my partner in Dharma, uh, Dharma Patni, as they say in Sanskrit, none of this would happen without her uh, bringing it into manifestation. Matter of fact, starting on Tuesday, one of the annual, semi annual in this case, Vedic holidays is called Navaratri, the nine days in which Mother Nature is honored twice a year. And there's a mantra that goes with that called the Nava Durga Stotra, the nine names or faces of Durga, Mother Nature. And Sandy wears all nine and has ten arms, but if you look close, <laughs> all of this happens because of the joint efforts of various people. The people doing increasing amounts of seva in our uh, culture here as well. And so those many people are lifting and holding this possibility. And that's the real meaning eventually of Dharma, is that you stand for something. And because we stand together, something very interesting can happen. So tonight, I'm going to share with you some of the very deep secrets of the, this culture from the place that we now politically call India, which is better known as Bharat. Would you say it? Bharat. 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 There's a book called the Mahabharat. Mm -hmm. Mahabharat is the great history or story um, of the country and culture of Bharat. And the Mahabharat itself was written 5,000 years ago, written down as an account of history. So it's also called Itihasa. Itihasa. Can you hear the word history in that Sanskrit word? History, Itihasa. So the word history came from the Sanskrit Itihasa. Just juggle the letters a little bit. This is how language is moved. So before I begin, before any teacher of the Vedas begins, because the Veda is a library of great wisdom that has been carried forward in time by persons who took the trouble to memorize it, to live it, and to ensure that it was passed on to the next generation. So we always begin by honoring those persons rather than simply beginning to speak. That way there's no confusion that the knowledge that's being spoken is originating with the speaker. That it's passing through them and that they're trying to live it. Kudos. Very nice. But that are not the source of it and no Vedic teacher claims to be. So we honor the previous teachers. So if you'd like you can say this, I'll say a line and you could say the line. This is to honor the gurus and teachers for whom this knowledge has been passed down to us. Aum. Aum. Guru Vishnu, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo, Guru Devo. Some got worried and started trying to hurry people and kind of lock them in. And the culture we live in is still suffering from some of the excesses done in the name of religion, done in the name of helping people, but a kind of coercion and an unnecessary pressure was put upon people by telling them that they were evil, by telling them that they were sinful, by telling them that they only have one chance. <laughs> and I just have to express the opinion of the Vedic culture that that's just not true and it's not intuitively it's not even true we're so resistant to dying it should tell us that dying is not our favorite the very idea makes us uncomfortable because we know we have so much more to do and having the health and strength and situation in which we can do it without causing harm to others 
would just be as close to paradise as you could get for where we're sitting. If you could just face each day and walk around and say, what haven't I done? What questions haven't I asked? What people haven't I spoken with? And if more people were like that, most people would find it easier to talk to strangers and to talk to people that they don't know. In no time at all, there'd be a protocol for introducing yourself to new people of the same sex or another sex or of mixed and those trying to decide or be both. All of these different kind of creatures would seem normal to us if we had thousands and thousands of lifetimes or grades in school to go. So I, I start with this for you because I, our culture is so pressured, so dangerous in some ways, a, a danger that probably has resulted from that pressure, that this knowledge won't land well for you if you stay in that pressured state of being, because you'll think it's something else also trying to invade you. It's not. It's not allowed to be coercive with Vedic knowledge. And some of my beloved friends uh, in various ashrams do this every once in a while out of excessive zeal. I've never done it, but I, I understand where they're coming from. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I did it till I learned better. And uh, I learned what everyone would learn if they went around trying to feed people by shoving food down their throat. It's so much more gracious if you hold the plate in front of them and say, are you hungry? So I want you to understand that if anyone has ever offended you in the name of the Vedic knowledge or any higher knowledge, they were misunderstanding the process of feeding someone. And they weren't quite aware of how to respect the fact that for this kind of education, it has to be both voluntary and it has to come from hunger. If you're not hungry yet, it's just not interesting to you. It's only when you're hungry for something or questioning for it. So I'll say this to you that the, the um, curiosity is looking for the cure and a quest is actually asking questions. Okay. So first you have to realize that something's not working as well as it could. In other words, until questions arise in you, the natural hunger for the answers isn't there yet. Neither will be the fire of digestion if the answer was to come. And a quest is done with respectful questions. So this is the entire basis of the Vedic culture of passing on knowledge. The teacher looks for students who are hungry and willing. And that degree of willingness is matched with one more thing, the ability to listen. There's two things that have to be there, the hunger to listen and the ability to focus well enough so that you can hear what was said, hold on to it, chew on it, and come back with a question. Question is digestion. Until you ask question, you aren't really gnawing at the knowledge. So guess what the knowledge is called in Sanskrit? Jnana. J-N-A-N-A, -N -N -A, jnana. Yeah. Like jnana, jnana, jnana. <laughs> and from that, the Greeks made it gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, and in English it became to know. But jnana sounds like what it is. It sounds like you're trying to gnaw on it, to chew it. And that's literally what this process is. So tonight I'm going to share some higher level jnana with you, some vidya, some Vedic knowledge. And the word Veda gave us the present word video, which means something that shows you. Using pictures and sound, it shows you. That's directly from the word Veda. You can see it, V-E-D-A, V-I-D-E-O. So knowledge is called vidya. Could you say it? Vidya. That vidya lets you see things that might otherwise be invisible. Just as someone who went someplace you didn't go, filmed it, brought it back, <coughs> presented it, allows you to the experience of going to that place. So what we're doing right now with each other, this is called a darshan. Darshan, darshan means when everybody is trying to see and when something is being shown, like a movie, so this is the ancient process of someone being the projector 
and someone listening and then trying to digest and then having questions and then digesting further by those questions and then going home with those questions on a quest trying to find what could extract the potential within me this is all for each of us what could extract <laughs> that potential which i know is there but i haven't found a way to extract it fully or properly yet so it is that which is within us the guru within you is the guru you will become when you start to occupy this seat of conducting the conversation the capability of doing that is intrinsically in every one of us as human beings but there are certain things that we also need as abilities and skills and things we might need to practice before we're ready for that so the degree of readiness of the student is called adhikari adhikari in greek it became edukare mm -hmm. and edukare means to bring forth from within and in sanskrit adhikari means the preparedness and readiness and willingness of the student <clears throat> How hungry are they? How qualified are they in skills for retaining and holding on to the knowledge and for turning it into important questions and then for implementing it? Are they at the implementation stage or is it all just still theory? Adhikari. So as you can hear, this gave us the word educate in English. Education is from adhikari and educare and you'll note that what's happened to our education is it's piling knowledge on top of people and not so much trying to find out who they are and draw that out. So a very important part of the original concept of Adhikari was addressing you at your stage of evolution. So the, the teacher would address each student as an individual at a particular stage of hunger, of questioning, of faculties and abilities and of many lifetimes or a few lifetimes of experience and evolution, then the truth that's true for everyone would be tailored to the needs of a particular student so that it's palatable to them at that moment. A little bit like cooking. You take the same basic foods, but you prepare them according to the tastes of the people that are going to be eating. If you didn't, you'd make it too spicy, too this, too much, too that too greasy to something. So think of it that way also with this knowledge. The most important thing is to relax. And if anything makes you uncomfortable that the teacher says, make a note of that and turn it into a question. Don't ever let it stay discomfort. That's the arrangement between the teacher and the student. And there is no other arrangement. So in any situation where the teacher asks you to do anything other than uh, questions and answer, you're not supposed to. So if a teacher ever asks you for something inappropriate, just say, thank you, Guruji, but that's not our contract. We're just here for exchanging knowledge back and forth. We don't have any other agreement and we don't have any other activity. That's also how the sacredness of it is kept. So if someone's going out of bounds, you remind them, say, oh, that's out of bounds. And if they're not going out of bounds, then good, nothing, then we're all fine. So the next thing is, there are degrees of learning, and the first thing to know in the, this conversation is the name of this discipline. So it's called Vedanta. Vedanta. That's two words, Veda and Anta. The word Anta gives us the word enter and inner, but also Antar, or that which preceded which came first. So Veda means, like I said, knowledge, that which allows you to see. So Veda Anta wants to do two things. It wants to discuss where we came from and the possibilities of where we could go next. Feel this situation that we're living in as humans right now. Is it not isn't precarious a good word? Isn't it precarious? Yeah. Just imagine all the things that could happen right now as we're talking. Some of the crazy people around the planet with nuclear weapons just get upset and use them. In, our, in, in a couple of hours, our whole world would be 
very, very risky, yes? Very precarious. But if it weren't for that, even without that, the yogic saying is that life is like a drop of dew on a lotus leaf. And the leaf is tilting and the water is above the pond. And any minute it could drop into the pond. Now, our body is mostly water with a very thin membrane holding the water in. If it started to leak through all different places, that would be quite awkward, would it not? If suddenly you were leaving puddles everywhere you went and losing weight quite rapidly. But we are just this bag of water held together by bodily tissues woven in some delicate way that we don't understand. But we see all the time people's liquids leak out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they're just they go away so we know that any minute we could spring a leak and that would be that <laughs> so this can't help but make us a little uncomfortable so it's important to think of our situation as uncomfortable but we because it's kind of embarrassing to walk around acting like you could spring a leak any minute we go i'm fine <laughs> How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> I mean, I almost wet the bed, but I'm fine. <laughs> Mike's from the leak any minute, but I'm fine. I really, I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> huh? Usually, both people just want to tell each other how terrible they are. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Really good. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> So this is why in the Vedas, we already know the problem is there. We don't want to create another one by trying to get you to join something. We already joined it. <laughs> so the problem is it's a tense situation. That's what this is. This is just a reminder. Don't fall over this way or this way. Don't go too far in, too far out. Don't get too far out of balance. It's the material world. It won't be good for you. This means the balance point. The other thing it means is, are you on your balance point or are you off your balance point? Because this class is supposed to be conducted from your balance point. You're supposed to be volunteering. You're supposed to be adhikari, hungry for it, not forced it, being forced fed it or coerced. And then it's going to be it's going to be conducted by questions, not just piling a bunch of information on top of you, but it's got to first act on questions. So the two questions that Vedanta is about are very obvious and they should be the ones we ask, but we don't think there's an answer, so we don't ask it. And that is, where did we come from and where are we going? Those would be the first two questions. If you just asked in sequence, if you just woke up someplace, you'd say, where am I? And then you'd try to think where you just came from. And then you'd ask, where are we going? Where are you taking me? So it's very important for this process to try to get back to these original questions and not be so adult that, you know, uh, yeah, sure, I know. Where are we coming? You know, so yes, where are we going? Where did that come from? Very interesting. I haven't got a clue. <laughs> Therefore, don't care less. <laughs> Try not to think about it, actually. Too difficult. Makes me upset. <laughs> okay, uh, I wouldn't bring it up except when you leave here, you've got to decide where you're going. I mean, you can just decide you're going home, but that begs the question. Because you get home and go, now where am I going? And every next going would be motivated by some question. But if the question is just, I'm hungry, where am I going to eat? That's kind of Groundhog Day, isn't it? I mean, that happens about three times a day, right? <laughs> okay, and there's something else that follows from that. Because automatically, you go in one door after you've gone in the other door. Right? Door to the restaurant, food goes in. Door to the bathroom, food goes out. Welcome to my world. I don't know about yours. <laughs> I bet I do, actually. <laughs> As a result, I bet there are some things we know about each other that we're doing and sharing and being in common right now, no matter how we're dressed, no matter what we look like, no matter where we're from, 
but it's all common. But all the people pointing nuclear weapons at us still have to go to the toilet. But they stop for a minute and think, I'm scaring the shit out of them. <laughs> this isn't good. I wouldn't like that. They would all relax and go back to this. They'd go, oh, what am I doing? Don't, don't point your weapons at me. I won't point mine at you. Let's, can we do this? Maybe. So the environment is already difficult. That's the basis of the Vedic knowledge. Therefore, don't try to increase it. Try to ask the questions in a very balanced way. So the person can take the question home and don't take advantage of someone who hasn't heard the question yet. And, you know, sort of, oh, by the way, have you heard this question? <laughs> don't dominate them with the knowledge. Okay. So this knowledge is a part of the human process. That's the way it's looked at. That the animals are not here. The reason there's not a lot of dogs, cats, and other animals here, they got the email, but they don't have a particular faculty that we do have, and that faculty is called manas. 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 So that manas is thinking, feeling, willing, and memory. Four faculties. If you didn't have memory that was sufficient, you'd forgot, you'd forget already right now why you came here tonight. You ask the person next to you, excuse me, but have you seen my coat? Do you know why I'm here? I've forgotten. Again, one of those awkward situations where you've forgotten why you're here. You see the problem? So these questions are going to be questions about our fundamental nature, but they're also going to be bring to our attention what we have in common. And so manas is the faculties that we sometimes call mind, but in the linguistic history, the man of manas is what gave us mankind. We are actually mind kind. And man does not mean masculine. It, it means able to think, feel, will, and remember. That's manas. So we are called manusha. Manusha. We are mind kind. That's why the animals are not here. We're the unique creatures on the planet who have this extra faculty that the animals only have in small parts. Mm -hmm. All creatures have it, and you can see it grow as you go up the species. You can see that they have more of it. But you can also see that theoretical questions don't occur the way they do for us. And certainly animals <coughs> don't show any symptoms of <coughs> obsessing over theoretical questions. And some of those theoretical questions are like the question, <clears throat> where do I come from? Where am I going? And of course, the one at the center of that is, who am I? What is my true nature? Since I'm constantly changing, <coughs> is there a, a version of me that isn't changing? Or in the midst of all the versions of me that I have been so far, which one of those should I call me? Are you following this? Dehi no smin yata dehe, this is Sanskrit. Komaram yovanam jara, tata de hantaras praptir, diras tatra namuyate. It's from the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, and it says, just as a human being has gone from childhood to youth to maturity and then to old age. Similarly, people buy clothing and it goes through the same stages, brand new, used a little, well used, worn out, gotten rid of. So just as you're not confused about wearing out clothing, so you should not be confused about wearing out bodies. Now, isn't that interesting? 
If you really believe that, if it's coming from a reliable source, then you would say, you mean this whole vehicle thing that I'm inside of here is just a skin. It's just like clothes. We all decided what to wear before we came here tonight. <clears throat> and so if this is true, we all through actions of our own created the body we're wearing. You may say, what was I thinking? But <laughs> <laughs> that's logical. Still, it's because it's even more interesting when you realize I call this the lunch body. This body's made out of lunch. <laughs> That's all it is. Sorry. It's food orbiting consciousness. It's little particles of food orbiting you. And if you go away, the food body just kind of, the lunch body is no longer edible. Have you noticed that? As soon as the food body you know, doesn't have someone inside, it just kind of goes. <clears throat> and you don't see a lot of people not too many making out with corpses. I mean, <laughs> I'm just saying. See, because the drivers, the drivers left the vehicle. So, I mean, we kind of get it and we kind of don't. If we really got it, we would just go, oh, I see, abandoned vehicle. <laughs> Where's busters when you need them? But I'm a little confused why we put formaldehyde in the veins, put them in a really nice suit, buy them suit. <laughs> Buy them some real estate, put them underground, and hope they last a thousand years. I mean, any record of someone coming back and reclaiming? I'm just asking. I've been doing a survey on this. <laughs> uh, anyone you know, you know, really come back and use that body again. Uh, recycle it, sort of, you know. That's different than reincarnation. In the South, that's called reincarnation. What, what incarnation are you talking about? <laughs> My previous incarnation. So this should become interesting to us, obvious to us. And if it does, you start changing your viewpoint radically. Because if you'll go with this, because Vedanta requires this, if you'll go with being the driver and not the vehicle, then you understand at any moment you could be asked to <clears throat> let me see your driver's license step outside the vehicle <laughs> right now any minute any one of us many of us are old enough that <laughs> we not be may not be talking when you leave <laughs> i mean and we should be pretty calm about it it's like yeah well you know 70,000 miles is pretty good. <laughs> My insurance is paid up. I'm all right. But there's no insurance, and that worries us. And this topic has been difficult to talk about because it's been in the hands of coercive people. So I do understand, and that's why many people in the modern times have been saying the guru is within you. Partly, like I said, it's partially true. It's a partial truth. But secondly, because so many people are coercive and so many people are laying traps for you, they're trying to help you find your autonomy first so that your adhikari, by being independent enough, that you get your independence and then look for a teacher. Otherwise, going to the teacher could give away your independence and you're not even independent yet. So there's wisdom in it. But there's also wisdom in understanding that there's different gradients of knowing and questioning is not disrespectful, it's the process. So this is very important for all of you because this isn't just a, a place where I say knowledge to you, but it's the interactive part is afterwards, you call me up on the phone and say, that was really interesting, can I ask you a question? And I can't say no because that's why I'm telling you the knowledge. So you'll do that. So I want you to know this class is an invitation to coming back with questions. And there's no cost in that. That's what I do. I'm a question and answer device. So what we're talking about is manas and manushya. And so manushya is who we are. And manas is not just mind, but mind, emotions, will, and memory. 
So now with that in mind, Vedanta says, whichever of those faculties you have the most of will create an inclination in you to learn that way. If you're mostly a thinker, you'll do what modern scientists are doing. They're trying to find out how this universe works. You'll notice they're not asking at all why it works. Because they think that question belongs to the fanatical religionists. And it did for the last thousand years in the West where modern science arose. So they thought that's your department. You're the fanatical, crazy, emotional person who has this supposed reality that I'm supposed to believe. And so I'm a thinker. I'm not a feeler. And you're a radical feeler. You're a crazy radical. You feel it and it must be true. And I don't believe it, says the thinker. So now what I'm showing you is the thinker, the feeler, and oh yeah, I'll be back. That's Arnie being eloquent, isn't it? <laughs> Hasta la vista. Mm -hmm. That was a divorce. That's a doer. That's the willing faculty. The willing faculty cares not about your thoughts. You think too much, according to the doer. You cogitate all the time. That's your problem. You're too busy thinking to do. The thinker says to the doer, and you, you're too busy doing to think where you're going. Or to even ask what needs to be done. So yes, you're good at doing, but you don't know why you're doing what you're doing. And the feeler says that scientists can tell you everything about the love letter, but they're afraid, afraid to read it. <laughs> the scientists have thoroughly studied the love letter. They refuse to read it. Why? Well, ask any scientist. What does this world come from? Does it come from love? No, it comes from chemicals. Okay, good. Then do you love your family? There's only one answer from a thinker. What is it? There's no such thing as love. There's only thinking. I mean, that's what the scientist just said. There's nothing but thinking. I'm thinking to find the answer to the universe. Well, but the answer to the universe doesn't just consist of thinking, does it? Because you go home and love your family or you don't know how to love. Which is it? Could it be that some people can only do and can't love and can't think? Could it be that some people can only think and they can't do and they can't love? That they don't have experiences of any great magnitude in those other areas because they're actually afraid to even experience those areas? Ask yourself this question. Look at yourself that way. Ask yourself, do you have libraries of books and notebooks with all kinds of notes that you're taking all the time, keeping track of the thoughts you're having and assessing them and comparing them to other thinkers? Are you doing that? Then you're not a professional thinker if the answer is no. And are you capable of having big emotions, but are they all negative? If you're, if you're only capable of feeling and now you're only having negative emotions, have you done well? No, because you don't know how to make sure that you have beautiful emotions. Instead, you're having ugly emotions all the time. So you're being dragged by your emotions instead of having beautiful emotions. And willing, if you're willing things to happen, really, are you totally in control? I mean, like totally. Just Can you just will things and they just come about? Try it. <laughs> You've tried it. The laughing people have tried it. <laughs> we all tried it. And yet we can't give up on any one of these faculties. We have all three. It would make sense to work on all three, would it not? Therefore, it would make sense to work on, find someone good at willing and to work out with them until they show you how to become better at that. And it would make sense to have some who has big emotions, but doesn't get destroyed by their own big emotions, but rather has beautiful big emotions. We do this all the time. It's called going to the movies. People who can't do something go to a, a, the movie and have someone else do it for them. That's what it is. Or do it for us so that we can role model it and learn how to do it. 
So then those become our role models in what to do. But it also puts a limit on the range of experience of those faculties. The thinking, the feeling, the willing, and the remembering. And raise your hand if you remember all of your previous lives. Raise your hand if you think you'd like to. It's a trick question. If you think that the internet keeps you busy, your last hundred previous lives and all the memories would keep you very busy. Plus all the emotions, because the memories would be nothing without the emotions. So now you're going to watch everyone you ever loved die for the last hundred lifetimes and have every fight again and every enemy again and be dragged through every situation again. Do you really want to go back for the last hundred lifetimes? I believe that's a thousand years or so. And replay every moment? Mm -hmm. So here's another question then, Vedanta question. If you only have one life, um, pardon me, but WTF, right? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'd like to know why you would give a damn about anything if you only have one life. Let's just be honest for a minute. Because you have no future, right? So really, if you have no future, why don't you just finally get honest and do whatever you want? <clears throat> and even if you did, why wouldn't that produce useful results? What if you just walked around taking whatever you want? Do you think it's a good idea? Do you think it'll work well? Have you ever tried it? <laughs> <laughs> right. So we're inside these interesting constraints. And we appear to be able to go somewhere but we're not clear where. We're here, but we're not clear why. We don't know quite where we came from or quite where we could go. There's no travel agent showing us exactly what's coming next. Isn't it interesting? So you've got to get on the edge of your chair a little bit before you're ready for Vedanta. Because Vedanta is going to try to answer some very, very interesting questions. And they're going to relate to each of those faculties, thinking, feeling, willing, and memory. I'll show you how. See? So what if you love and get really hurt? Now, I know that's never happened to any of you. <laughs> Come on, what grade did it start? Give me a number. <laughs> Fifth, fourth, right, fourth. Deadly, fourth is terrible. I got married at four. <laughs> she was beautiful, but... That wool suit itched. It was terrible. It was a presage of never mind. <laughs> anyway, we were divorced by the time she was seven. <laughs> so that means you could really get clobbered with your emotions, right? Right, right. So how would it be if I say this week, go out and have the perfect emotional experience this week? Sound easy? You know, just go grab someone and have a perfect emotional experience. Can I send anybody home now? <laughs> <laughs> That's tempting. <laughs> Can you give me the perfect experience? Well, you could. <laughs> Got out of that one real quick, right? <laughs> But do you, do you, how many people do you know who've tried to have perfect emotional experiences and then stopped trying to have emotional experiences at all <laughs> for quite a long time? They're called blues singers. <laughs> and the ones that think too much are called comedians. <laughs> that c c comedy is better than suicide is their motto. <laughs> right? They can't stop thinking, so they become comedians. Can't stop talking, so they're just. Burr, 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 burr. <laughs> but if you live with them, they get home, they go. Burr, 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 burr. <laughs> then it's not funny anymore. So big feelings, big thinking, big doing. Everybody who's got those, how many war veterans who thought it was noble and glorious to go off to Vietnam or the Middle East or some other place? Well, maybe was, maybe wasn't. Jury's out. But when that mortar shell landed on the Jeep you were driving, 
oops. So that's the many, many heroes that nobody talks about when they point out Arnie. Arnie's being paid not to get blown up. It's a movie. So he makes it look good. But the fact of the matter is that that path is also full of all kinds of dangers that cause reactions. What I'm pointing out here is that the human condition is such that in order to gain these faculties, you have to put up with quite a bit. That's where this comes from. Realizing how much you've been putting up with just to get this far, how skillful and clever and how many things were thrown at you and how many ways you were not treated well, how many things that could go wrong, and yet you're still standing, you're still here. And the easiest thing to say is, why even bother? Just fold up the cards and go, I'm done. Because we're in such a precarious situation. So this is where Vedanta comes in. But before we go into the next step of Vedanta, have you heard of the six blind people touching the elephant? This is a famous story coming from India about six blind people who were asked to investigate an elephant and report their findings. So one was touching the side and we said, this is obviously a wall. One was touching a leg and said, this is obviously a pillar. One was touching the tail and said, this is obviously a broom. One was touching the trunk and said, this is obviously a snake. One was touching the ear and said, this is obviously a fan. Who was right? Everyone. Who was wrong? Everyone. So this process of touching the elephant is called darshan. The root is dristi. Dristi means to see or vision or to have a sensory experience. So every single one of us in this room right now, like the blind people, is touching the elephant. And if you've ever wondered what Ganesha is, now you understand. Everything you touch is the elephant, including you. You're a work in progress. So you have an animal body and a human head. To make fun of you, Ganesha has an animal head and a human body, mirroring the situation. You have an animal body with the impulses that are the same as the animals. And your human head is riding on top of it. And because your senses are in varying degrees of capability, and everyone in this room has a different nose, so therefore if noses were simply machines that measure smell, there would be the perfect nose in this room, and then next to perfect and next to perfect, somebody in this room might become a perfume maker and be able to smell a complex perfume and tell you all 20 ingredients. There are people whose nose can do that. So the instruments are all different with which we're gathering the evidence. Isn't that interesting? Sense of smell, sense of taste, sense of hearing, sense of sight, sense of touch. Those are the five main senses that we're using all the time. Then to get around, we grab things. So grasping, these are our active senses. We locomote, we walk from place to place. That's an active sense. We have a sexual organ that we use periodically to try to derive some pleasure. That is an active organ. We have an anus out of which food is expelled, no longer useful. And we have a mouth, which we use for talking and eating. And so those are the active senses. Now, I'm pushing you toward the thinking part of your manas, aren't I? Did you get the five perceptive senses? They are smell for earth, water for taste, fire for sight, requires light, air for touch, and space for hearing, because sound is traveling through space. Got it? And then the active senses, grasping, 
is connected to seeing, because if you can't see, uh, sorry, grasping is connected to air, locomotion is connected to seeing or fire, because to go from place to place, you have to have light. And then sex is connected to water. It's called the lower tongue. It's like the upper tongue. It's, it's run by water. It's one of the water organs. And then talking is the active sense for the mouth. And so that the object then is words, like we're doing right now. Ten senses we have. Have you got them? Do you think you could repeat them back? Five active senses, five perceptive senses. The nose goes with the anus because one smells and the other is smelly. <laughs> the tongue goes with the genital because they both operate on water. The eyes go with the feet because the eyes have to see where the feet are going. The skin goes with the grasping because the grasping and the skin and the air all go together. What I'm doing right now, what I just switched to, is a yoga called Jnana Yoga. I told you about it. Now we just did Jnana Yoga together. Because as you were focusing and trying to get those details, if you could repeat them back to me right now, you have pretty good equipment for thinking. Because you would have cataloged them, logged them in, gotten them, and be able to repeat them back. You'd be the head of the class if you could do that and in various gradients down. Your emotions might be thinking while I'm doing it, that's cute, but I want to feel something. And if you're a feeling individual, you'd be bored with the thinking part and say, let's get to the good part. Tell me who kisses the girl. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to hear about noses and lips and all these other things. <laughs> I want to see them in action. <laughs> Marnie, I want to see a fight. I want to see something happen. I want to see something accomplished. Or I want to feel the feeling. <coughs> so, if you remember where I started us, who is changing the clothes? Who is changing clothes? I haven't said yet. I haven't put a name on it. But according to the Sanskrit, according to the Veda, the name for that consciousness that's inside the clothing that we're wearing is Atma. A-T-M-A. -A. The Vedantic question is, when did the Atma get involved in this process? Why did we get involved in it? And since we're not the same as the things that are coming and going, is it possible we could get out of it? But if you approach those questions in a state of frustration, here's what might happen. The person who's just been jilted, you tell them you have a wonderful boyfriend or girlfriend to introduce them to, what do they say? No, I'll stay at home alone. I'm nursing my wounds right now. No, thank you. Maybe I'll try again someday, maybe not. That's called Buddhism. With no disrespect, that's called any teaching that tells you the emptiness would be better than this. <laughs> Conversely, if somebody was madly in love and you said, would you like to come with me to the emptiness? They'd say, no. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to the dance with my boyfriend, girlfriend. I want to go enjoy. I want to go feel the feelings. I don't want to go. Go to the nothing. But, and if someone told you, hey, I'm having a retreat this year, what are we going to do? We're going to get in an empty room and stay there for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know if you'll pay for that. Sandy <laughs> <laughs> oh. wanted me to ask that question. <laughs> So really, um, I, I know you're frustrated, so I'm going to lead you to the emptiness because you'll probably buy it. Now, I'm not being disrespectful to the Buddha Dharma because there are many truths that were taught along with that final goal that are very useful, very valuable, very important. Just because the conclusion is wonky doesn't mean 
a lot of things along the way weren't very, very interesting because this is a complex situation. So if you were having trouble controlling your emotions and you learned how to go to the emptiness, you would totally get over not being able to control your emotions. Because after a while, you'd know how to shut them down and have some relief from them rather than being stuck in them. And if you knew that just by simply controlling your breathing, you could control your emotions, that would be a huge relief. So you might just go, next time you started heavy breathing, you'd go, oh, I see what I'm doing. Uh, now your emotions are under control. So all these tricks that really do do something that come from all of these different powers that humans could have are effective. To say they're not effective is to just not have lived. They're effective, they're powerful, and they do something. But here's the trick. If I say to you, emptiness is the most interesting conclusion and destination of life. Can I prove that? Who can I prove it to? Those people who are the most miserable. If you're very miserable and frustrated, then I can prove to you by removing you from your misery and frustration that emptiness is better than the life you're living. But if somebody's having the life of Riley, if somebody's having everything they want from life, and they have beautiful friends and health and strength and well-being and wealth and resources, and they're out there living a great life. How much do you think they would pay you to go to emptiness? So how did emptiness become a final conclusion? And the answer is because this world is under so much pressure, <clears throat> so much pressure that if your whole culture had just been bombed to pieces, you just might want to go to nothingness. You just might. We're really fortunate. It's easy to say, I don't want to go to nothingness when you're sitting in a safe place. But when you've just had everything that you considered beautiful destroyed and burned and crushed and smashed and blown up, and you're sitting there afterwards, it could take you quite a long time to not want to just go to the emptiness. So I'm not in any regard being disrespectful to the people who are having these many experiences. What I'm trying to get you to see is Vedanta wants to talk about the evidence in front of us and whether or not it leads to a particular conclusion. So let me ask you a question. If you see beauty and respond to it as beauty and are attracted to it, then in the long run, what are you going to do about that? How are you going to arrange to still have that beauty constantly? Doesn't it look like it gets taken away? Doesn't it appear that way? Let me say that differently. Doesn't all the evidence prove that the beauty that any of us have chased after is now or in the future will be gone? Yes. So there's two possible conclusions you could come to. One is it's a bad joke to get me completely interested and then take it away. And the other is it is still available and you were giving me a taste to increase my hunger. Those are the two possibilities. But in order to believe the second one, you'd have to take a long view. And what is aging, if not the inability to do what you did when you were young and enjoying yourself in your youthful body? And if that's so, then from 70 to 90, what do you know for sure? You're not gonna be like you were from 20 to 40. You know that for sure. So Vedanta is posing the questions do you really believe that all the beauty that you've seen is a lie and that it's an illusion and that it just arose here by accident and is going to disappear and be gone and you've just been tricked? 
if the last thousand people you met were all con artists and every single one had lied to you and every single one had tricked you and every single one had not been sincere with you, you might think you have a lot of evidence that all people are like that. So tell me, are all people like that? Dr. House says they all lie. Do they all lie? Is the whole thing a lie? Or is the whole thing a vast opportunity for everyone all at the same time to be experiencing radically different realities in the same matrix of reality? This means if you can understand this, then you can see that your circumstances should not create your conclusion. Now, we're at yoga. We're on our way to Vedanta, but we've just taken a little detour to yoga. <coughs> yoga says, if you can remember that you are the Atma, remember that word? Say it again. Atma. If you are the Atma, the indestructible, immortal, intelligent, conscious, feeling, aware, individual, if you, the light of consciousness, are that forever, then this means that every circumstance here is just that, is a circumstance with a beginning, middle, and end. So one of two things is going to happen during those circumstances. You're either going to forget that you're the Atma and succumb to the experience and be dragged along by it, or you're going to stay detached from the parts of the experience you don't like, and you're going to realize that only parts of it could possibly be likable, <clears throat> and you're going to then go through it holding a different perspective, realizing that after X amount of time, you're still going to be the Atma, but that circumstance is not going to be there. By the way, that circumstance is called winter. Can you feel it coming? <laughs> if you forget upon leaving here that winter is coming, you'll panic. You're going to leave, you're falling off the trees. <laughs> Why? I hate that. <laughs> it makes life miserable. I, I want to kill myself. <laughs> because things die. So you want to die because things die. Yes. <laughs> I see. Uh, perhaps you misunderstood. What if you stick around till spring? Can I convince you to do that? This is suicide hotline, right? Now, can I convince you to stick around until springtime? <laughs> you date my sister. <laughs> Anything. What do you want? <laughs> Can we change your perspective? Could changing your perspective change everything? Could changing your perspective get you to not be angry at beauty for letting you down and occurring periodically within this field of reality? Could there be another reality where that doesn't occur? Could that be why we want it? What if we come from a reality like that where beauty never goes away? And what if we volunteered to visit this amusement park, which is not always so amusing. But what if we came here for the experience in order to have a contrast between the place that we're fond of, where you always get the stuff you like. And I don't mean a cornball paradise. I mean a different kind of reality altogether. In other words, in Vedanta, you have to answer all the questions. And the question you have to answer is, where did that part of us come from that wants beauty? If the world is intrinsically ugly, then that would just follow that the part of you that looks for beauty always couldn't have come from here because here beauty never lasts forever. So even the desire for beauty to last forever could not arise here unless you brought it in from somewhere else. Ipso facto, therefore, we had foreknowledge that we were going on an adventure. We're immortal beings, and those immortal beings 
mm -hmm. uh, only would think of annihilating themselves because they got the idea by visiting the temporary material world. But even though the material world is pounding them constantly, they still haven't given up the idea that maybe I could find that beauty someplace where I get to keep it. And I don't lose it. But that argues against all the evidence of what? The material world. If I ask you now, is there any place in the material world where you can have things and keep them forever? Very few takers, I think. Because none of your experience says so. So that's the whole weight of that evidence against you. What do you want? You want it to last forever. You don't want it to go away. You don't want it to die. You don't want it to get old. You don't want it to fade. Exactly. So Vedanta says that part of you, if you listen to that part, you'll realize that the bean counter in your brain has become, has convinced you that you are wrong in your ideal that beauty could last forever. And that in fact, it obviously gets destroyed. Therefore, destruction is the supreme. Therefore, all of this is a bad joke. Therefore, none of it really exists. And therefore, it's all one or it's all nothing is just a way of saying, I'm tired of even talking about this. It's just an irritation. I don't want to think about it again because I, I'm convinced I'm wrong that beauty doesn't last. If you can understand this, that's the pivot around which you're going to get derailed from beauty and all of the things that beauty implies, which is those moments of intense interaction that take you to a whole nother level of experience that transcend matter. And we've all had them. Matter itself induces those moments. It just gets to some moment. It's just that Kodachrome moment, right? Where the sun's just there and the moon's there and everything's there and you just go, ah, 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 overwhelmed by the beauty, overwhelmed by the beauty. So you're either going to believe that moment and pursue it, or you're going to go, what was I thinking? Everything gets destroyed. It was just a moment. I'm over it now. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Soon as you go back to that, then oneness or emptiness <laughs> sound like a relief. It's better than buffering. It's the ultimate painkiller. So I want you to understand that both emptiness and oneness are stages of Vedanta. I'm not against them in any way, shape, or form. I'm simply reminding you that Vedanta keeps asking all the questions, and until the question of where beauty comes from is answered, technically, you can't stop. If you do, you're just angry. If you stop before that, it's just out of frustration. That oneness and that emptiness is a drug, not a conclusion. That's what the yogis say. Now, here's the other thing that's interesting. They also say because you are genuinely an individual, you can pursue any of these conclusions that you want for as long as you want indefinitely. Isn't that interesting? Because you see, not only can no one coerce you to the answer, it arises entirely through your experience. So what if we're here gathering experience? What if that's what we're here doing? And that is indeed what Vedanta says. Well, in that case, without the proper experience, you can't bring someone to the conclusion. Which is why I'm talking to you the way I am in this kind of broken field running, because I'm giving you the questions. Why? Because you have to pursue the answers. That's called Vedanta. Veda Anta. Where did it begin? Where does it end? If you say, my life's too busy to ask those questions, I say, I understand. Welcome. But if you say that, then I ask, if I may ask, how long will you stay like that? How long will that distraction continue? 
until you can hold a continuous thought in spite of being dragged around. Do you not notice that you're being dragged around by the stupid people that are taking control of your life? So the fact of the matter is that the stupid people that are taking control of your life are pushing the intelligent questions of Vedanta out of your head. By making your life so uncomfortable, you don't think it's worthwhile to think the real questions of life. Could it be? Yeah. So dull yourself some more. Or don't. Or and ask what you should be reading next. Because the Vedic library has the Q&A about these topics. Now there's one more piece to this. And that piece is either the universe is intelligent and communicates with us actively by sending representatives back and forth to do so or not. So that would be a very important question to get answers to. So if there's a library of supposed knowledge that has been brought back and forth in that way, and you don't have the curiosity to take a look at it, then I would say it's probably because of the dumb job that you're overwhelmed by, or the last misery that you're overwhelmed by, or your dog died, or somebody died, or something left, and you would invested everything in that one object, and it left, and you've given up temporarily. And as a result, you're not in pursuit, intense pursuit of those places where you haven't asked the right questions yet. And what if, what if you really are an immortal being? How would that change everything? How would you live in the temporariness of the material world that we're living in right now as an immortal being? What would that look like? How would you talk to everybody? What would you say to them when they say, how are you today? Like you say, who are you today? <laughs> Mightn't you change the subject in slight ways? Nudging, not pushing, not coercing, not converting, nudging them toward a more interesting question. So what if that's what we're here doing? Nudging uh, each other toward questions that are either the obvious ones. What are you doing with your 10 senses today? Think about that for a second. I see people all the time because I'm looking at them and they're looking at me and their dog's about to pee or poop on my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> or worse, on our flowers. And I'm looking down at them going, and they're looking up at me going. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going. <laughs> and they're going. <laughs> But what if our 10 senses are just like those puppies, as innocent as those puppies in a certain way? They pee, they poop, they eat, they sleep, they, is it not so? I mean, every one of us, raise your hand if you don't get dragged around through your day by peeing and pooping and sleeping and eating. <laughs> like, you know, sleepy, dopey, grumpy, and you know. <laughs> these, are the, these are the seven dwarfs. <laughs> That are running our lives. Well, in between, what else do you do? That's the Vedanta question. What else do you do other than eat, sleep, mate, and defend? What else do you do other than just be with your animal senses and just get dragged along on that wheel? What's real? The wheel? Or what's real to you? Do you hold some state of emotion outside of that? So here's the next question. If you can fall in love with a someone, then could you fall in love with the source of all the someones? Or rather, how could you not? If you'll fall in love with just one piece of the reality that's the source of all the reality around you, how amazing would it be if you went one-on-one -on -one with the source? But what if you can't join anything to have that happen? You have to have the guts to do it. That's all. Now, none of us in this room would claim we can make a being as beautiful as the beings that we see all around us, or as interesting, or diverse, or everything, or as complex. And yet, something has. All right, so what if you simply make knowing that something your primary desire? 
What if that becomes your white hot, intense primary desire? And I just, the rest of the stuff, I just do what I have to do. I have to do some stuff so I can eat. I have to do some stuff so I can do live. I have to do this. I have to sleep and poop and do to do the rest. Of, I've got about eight hours to myself. <laughs> and I'm really focused on these interesting things. And what if it makes you feel different to be that way? What if changing your focus has a completely different effect on your body, on your cells, on your thoughts, on your emotions? Now you're getting somewhere. Now what if previous persons like yourself have followed these thoughts to a point and say, I can't prove this to you, you have to prove this to you, but if you create a link through sound vibration between the things you can't see, because it's obvious that the whole planet is supported by things we can't see. Point to the law of gravity for me, please. Me and physicists have been wanting to see it forever. And yet it's there. So something invisible is holding all of this together, just like these beads. If you only look at the beads, you don't see the thread. But the thread is there, holding them all together. So the thread that's holding all of this together is what Vedanta wants us to look at. You don't have to go anywhere to do it. You don't have to change anything to do it. You just shift. You stop looking at the bead and you look at the thread and you go, <coughs> <laughs> now can I ask him to leave? <laughs> because it's crazy making. What did the girls say back in the 60s? I'm gonna go crazy on you! Crazy on you! That's what everybody wants. Somebody go crazy on me! Yeah, go crazy on me, yeah, please. <laughs> Don't hurt me, just go crazy on you. <laughs> but what if it's already crazy? What if it's just we can't take it? What if it's just no one's taught us to dial in? What if it's totally free? What if that's the joke? It's totally free. All you have to do is look at it and go, ah, I got it, I'm back. I see it, I feel it, I will it, I'm there, okay, now what? Now, live that in such a skillful way that you don't cause harm to others through knowing it and be available to them to share it when they're ready, but never coerce them and never try to force them because just as you couldn't be coerced, so no one can. So therefore, you learn to be that and now your beingness is partnered with the invisible beauty that makes all beauty possible. Mm -hmm. Now you understand the beauty and why just going to the emptiness or light was not asking all the questions. You were forgetting a couple of the questions. Why did the beauty entrance me so much before I got frustrated and gave it up? thinking that I wasn't going to get any more. But that's because I was fixated on the manifestations of the beauty that are temporary, that can't be kept, instead of the beauty that was reflected in that, that is a part of the source, which is the thread that's holding it all together. And I can have that by not having that. If I grasp the part that can't be kept, it all gets ruined. The whole focus is lost. As soon as I don't grasp the part that can't be kept, my energy is available to see the beauty that can't be destroyed, that keeps replicating itself and replicating. You know what the real torture of getting old is? Everyone is younger than you. <laughs> Too young. Too young. Isn't this the final learning? Thank you. This is the final learning. As you get old, everyone's too young for what? To play with. But isn't all we really want is to play with someone? Do you understand? That's why it's called love play. All you wanted was someone to play with. And then it just got complicated. 
<laughs> but what we really, we really, we, so, I mean, this is one of the most beautiful things in the Old Testament. It says, unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter into the kingdom of the divine. You have to become childlike again. You have to take back beauty like a child takes it back, not like a grumpy adult who didn't get what they want. <laughs> Because then you want to go to the oneness drug or you want to go to the emptiness drug. And while you're taking that drug, you're forgetting about the beauty <coughs> and therefore forgetting about your frustration for not getting the beauty the way you wanted to get it. And that's the problem. We're trying to get the part of the beauty that is temporary. That's the part. We're trying to hold on to the thing you can't hold on to instead of holding on to the beauty. And so this is the final Vedantic discussion. It doesn't negate the emptiness discussion because when you find out that space or emptiness is behind all of this manifestation, that's amazing. You could spend a couple lifetimes just getting that. And then when you understand that light is making everything that you see around you, you'd want to go into the light and see how it's doing that. But when you realize that the colors are all emerging from the light, like the images in a film projector, then you realize that behind what appears to be the facade of oneness of the light is the diversity that you've been experiencing down here in its original and prototypical form. This is the spinal secret of Vedanta. Emptiness is one of them. Oneness is another one. It's just if you stop asking questions, you could ignore beauty and go to oneness. You could ignore beauty and go to emptiness. But unless you come back and ask the final question, okay, good, that was great. I did emptiness, I'm as calm as I can be, I'm over myself, I got it, thank you for that. Okay, I went into light, I realized we're all the same kind of being, I see that we're all similarly constructed, I see that light and shining in everyone, I don't forget it now, and I don't forget to be it myself. Great, that's wonderful, what a wonderful attainment. It's not like these are sects against each other. They're stages or questions that lead to each other. So if you got relief and you're relaxed now and you can breathe properly and you don't grasp anything. So nirvana means nothing is mine. Point to something that's yours around you. Anything that you're carrying, tell me it's yours. Prove it. You can't. You already know you can't. You just lost it in the courtroom. You know it's not yours. You know you just stole it and you're holding it. You're holding stolen goods and that the matter is going to take them back any minute. Great. So once you understand that, you relax. You're no longer holding stolen goods. That's called Buddhism. It's a wonderful, wonderful step. You get so relaxed. You go, I don't own any of this shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's not mine. Near mama. Near mama, it's not mine. Nope, it's not mine. I'm just using it. No, nope. it's not mine though. You take it back anytime you want. I'm just borrowing it. What a relax that is. Instead of holding stolen goods and knowing someday it's going to be taken back and holding it tighter. <laughs> Don't take my arm, oh, it's all mine, it's all mine. What a horrible place to be. We call it a creepina. In Sanskrit, it's called a creepina. In English, it's called creepy. <laughs> this is Howard Hughes with long nails and long hair and billions of dollars, and he's all alone till the, let me find him that way. And you're dead in one room apartment because all of his stuff wasn't any good and it wasn't his. Right? So in the light, too. You go in the light, now you're enlightened. Great, so now what are you going to do? What happened to play? If you become the light, how can you play? If you're a being of light, you can play. But if you become the light, you can't do anything. You're just a light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not an improvement. That's not an upgrade. <laughs> I was a human, now I'm a light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> What, what? <laughs> it's kind of a eureka moment. What? This is watch me worry. <laughs> oh, for deflorescence. So, so we misunderstand these things because we're coming from this rough environment of coercion. So it's really important. These ideas are meant to be playful. That's why I try to make them a little fun because it, it communicates that they're not coercive. You do not have to do this. <coughs> there is no time limit on you. You can come back as many times as you want and come at these questions and have the same experiences and try to own matter again and again and again and again. And if you want to do it more, good, then do it more. There's no, no rule that says you can't. 
It's just set up that way. You can say that's not fair. That's Groundhog Day. Well, it's also very fair because you can come back as much as you want to get whatever you want to get out of this. That's great. And that's horrible. <laughs> it's scary and it's wonderful. And it's amazing. Right? So get into it. Stand up into it. Stand right up into it and say, okay, I get it. So the conclusion that you're leading me to, if I've got you right, Kavindra, is that you're not telling me what to do. You're telling me what I'm capable of doing. I could go one-on-one -on -one with the being that's the source of everything. I could insist upon that, and there's nothing that can stop it. I mean, yeah, Tony Robbins is right. There's a giant inside of everyone. Most of the people that do that in this world are stepping on people while they're the giant. I'm sorry, but that they missed the part where they're hurting everyone else to be the giant. If they got that too, if that was part of the teaching, I'd love it. Yes, there's a giant within you. A very famous giant named Ravana who ravages and steals and rapes and takes whatever he wants. Yes, but there's also a powerful protector giant inside of you that doesn't do that. So become that one. Try that. And if you do, you'll find that the more powerful you become, the more you're accountable to the well-being of every living entity around you, the true warrior. And then the more power you have, the less you're inclined to use it as power. The more you're inclined to be gentle and caring and respectful. The other lesson of Buddha. Yes, you have that power. Therefore, why would you force, why would you impose it upon those who don't realize they have it yet? Become their protector. Now at least you've understood what to do with your with your energy of love and beauty. But that's compassion. So compassion is the upper limit of that particular game. It's like a martial arts style. It's not uninteresting. It's not untrue. It's powerful and true. It just hasn't answered the final question, which is where do beauty, love, and the possibility of getting a room full of people together who get along for a whole year? What if we had an island? We made a vow that we would not fight with one another for a whole year. We would just walk around. You know, there's a tribe in Brazil like this. You ever seen the movie about this? There was a tribe in the Amazon that their tactic was if anyone in the tribe was unhappy, we were all unhappy. And they would follow any unhappy person around. <laughs> Groups of members of the tribe. The women, do you want sex? Do you want love? Do you want to kiss? Do you want to go make love? Whatever you want. And they could be someone else's wife. It didn't matter. It wasn't, she wasn't leaving her husband. She was doing therapy. <laughs> she was just being therapy for an unhappy guy who looked like maybe that would help. Whatever put a smile on your face. Was, <laughs> that was their attitude. Whatever puts a smile on your face. I've done my job for the day. And you're happy again. The tribe's back to happy. <laughs> Pretty interesting, pretty interesting. But if you think, and, and I'm not recommending this, <laughs> not, not right away. <laughs> when I decide to do what Rajneesh did, I'll let you know. <laughs> but meanwhile, what if the thrill, as you would have found out if you had followed him, is not in the yucky, gooey, room full of group sex with rubber walls it's in the love you feel that could have created that moment but the sticky gooey part is not so cool because we're in matter but the part where you see everyone and feel that immense love and see their beauty and go crazy because you're looking at them and seeing their beauty and their potential and who they really are the ability to see the beauty in everything and see what it really is that is what all those other promises of final pleasure were about yeah, it looks like you could jump in a room full of naked bodies and it would just be amazing. In fact, it would be just the opposite because you're going against the laws of the divine. The laws of the divine are, it's not physical, dummy. As soon as you try to make it into property, it evaporates. As soon as you back off just a little bit and look in just the right way, you can see it again and you go, ah, ah, and now you're in ecstasy. So it turns out that matter has this tricky judo quality to it. You grab it the wrong way and it grabs you and pins you to the mat. And if you grab it in just the right way, you don't own it. So that's nirvana. That's the emptiness. You be empty of it. Don't own any. Then go to the light. See everyone's light. Look around and see their light. Don't see the physical form first. Don't see their fashion first. Don't see what they're projecting first. See the light that's shining their movie and see that light and go there. And now, now wait patiently 
and invite them to come out of hiding and invite them to not be afraid because of the millions of times it hasn't worked when they were their real self with someone in the material world. This is Vedanta. I'm making it sort of street level Vedanta, but these are the <laughs> questions of Vedanta that they're trying to ask us. So the last secret of this is, this is called an avatar. At a certain time in history, a being comes to earth and stays for a hundred years. The avatars <laughs> do not come and get nailed on a cross and leave at 30. That <laughs> might happen to a teacher, it doesn't happen to an avatar because the avatar is controlling the movie. They're here to stay on the ground long enough to do everything you can do with human beings to show love. It's really important to understand. The number one reason they come is if it gets out of balance here. The number two reason is to show all the reasonable human beings where love could lead and that it doesn't stop and that love and beauty continue and that when you just believe that that is true and act as if that's true, you start changing everything. That's all, because it's totally binary. You will either believe that or you won't believe it. That's all. You don't have to join anything. There's no church to join. There's no thing to do. It's not a religion. It's a part of being you is to, you could decide to make that decision, but unless it's presented to you that way, you wouldn't feel confident that you have the right to make that decision. That's the part where you're the, your guru. You are your guru because only you can make that decision. No one can or should try to make that for you. That is the decision and only you can make it. Will you bet everything on beauty? I am betting everything on beauty. I decided 50 years ago in the presence of an old man who brought this message from somewhere in India that I've never been to and had never been to. And, but I was a philosopher and I was just ready for somebody to ask me what was beyond the emptiness and oneness, which I had thrust myself completely into. But there was a nagging question and no one had articulated it because no one understood Vedanta well enough. That's all. Vedanta is you ask the right question of people and that question digests the person. Do you understand? Everything that's stopping you from understanding is digested by the question. Will you give beauty up just because you're getting old? Will you give it up just because some people hurt you? Will you give it up just because the world has disappointed you? What will make you give it up? What will make you give beauty up? Or will you pursue it to where you go next? Or wherever you go? Or wherever it takes you? Are these not the vows that we would have said to someone if we really love them? That I will live with you until you, I burn your body because you're no longer here. I will hold on to you and you will hold on to me because I see you. And I'm going to hold on to that. So what if this whole thing is just that? What if it's just holding on to beauty and from that, everything else that you decide rests on that? What if it's the one decision that once you make it, you develop the muscles that are necessary to hold on to that? Because that's what it is. Because whatever you go home with from this night, whatever you grasp out of this, if you can't use your thinking and your feeling and your willing and your memory together is a single unit to decide that you've been being an amateur and loving little chunks of beauty, but you've decided to go straight to the source. Why? Because you finally were told by ancient rishis from India, who cares where from, that you and only you can decide to not give up on beauty. And only you can hold on to it until it comes to you and begs you to come to the dance, asks you to come to the party. That's the giant within you. It's not a giant. It's a dancer. It's a singer. It's an artist. It's a creator. It's a beauty. It's a lover. It's a joy. It's a baby. It's everything you've ever loved. It's all those things in all those stages of beauty, in all those stages of being. And as soon as you understand that, then you go, okay, in the midst of the context of everything burning and falling apart and dying, I've been giving, given glimpses of everything. I've been giving glimpses of this beauty, like it's shining out. 
from this dark covering. And every once in a while I get another glimpse. And instead of letting those glimpses make you unhappy because they appear to go away, you realize that you're seeing that one truth that will never go away, that can't go away, and now you know what you're pursuing. That's what you're pursuing. That's what you've been pursuing. You never were pursuing anything else. <coughs> Every time you went at it again and going, here we go again. You get it, that you're going at it again. That's Vedanta. You're going to where you came from and now, but you're going back there with a different being. And the being that you go back there being is powerful enough to get the full experience. That's the final conclusion of Vedanta. Ata, ato, Brahma, Jijnasu. The Vedanta Sutras begin now, now that you're ready, therefore, therefore, because you've done everything else, let us inquire Jijnasu into <coughs> Brahman, into that which never dies. Now that we've stopped being agitated over dying, let's inquire into what shines through that which does die and does not die. Now let us follow what does not die back to where it comes from, and that's where we're going. I'm going. I don't know where you're going, but I've decided <laughs> where I'm going. I'm going where beauty comes from. I've decided. And nothing can change that because I've decided. That's how powerful we are. Beauty can't change that. If beauty tries to change that, I'm justified. I go, see, you came to me. You get it? Beauty can't come to me because that's what I'm asking for. So if beauty wants to convince me that I can't come to beauty, beauty can't come to me because then I win. Ah. This is Vedanta. This is perfect logic. <clears throat> so you understand, if beauty stays away, then I still win. Because I'm right, because now I'm more powerful, because I'm going to pursue beauty no matter where it goes. But what I'm not going to do is pursue that which is not worth pursuing, which is everything that isn't beautiful. Thank you. So therefore, I'm not going to dwell on that part of you either. Now, here's what the yogis call this. They call this the eyes of the bee or the eyes of the fly. The fly is looking for stool. <laughs> The bees are looking for honey. Both are here in the material world. You may look on, focus on whichever one you want. Whichever one you make your object of meditation, you will become it. So, if you meditate upon that temporary destructive force that is reducing everything here to compost, then you will have the consciousness of compost. It will become your state. In other words, you will be converted to it. Then it's your, quote, religion. It isn't a group you joined, it's your state of being. You're meditating on the part that's temporary. That's what the flies are looking for. In the same backyard, the bees are looking for flowers the epitome of beauty that are budding, that's buddhi, that's your discerning faculty. That's that which is always beautiful and new. And all that beauty, the secret of getting old is you realize that in yourself and others, that beauty is now disguised. You used to have it as your skin. Now it's disguised. Now they can only see it by looking into your eyes. They can't see it by looking at your body or looking at your skin or looking at anything else because that doesn't look like it used to. <laughs> and so now you're in the advanced stages of either hating life and looking at the poop and watching everything turn to poop, or you're looking through it and seeing the beauty. And now you see that the beauty is more within because the longer you live, the more you understand that you get to a point where you truly understand it or you're truly broken. You are just a pile of poop hoping to die. Or, <laughs> or you're a pile of poop grinning like a Cheshire cat. And you're going, yeah, I thought I'm not the bug. <laughs> Joke's on you.
Vedanta is a very big subject. It's difficult to share with you in a small compass, in a small amount of time. But when the avatars come, they come to show that it's entirely reasonable that human beings can have the most intimate love that they could ever imagine with the source of everything. Just because my brethren in the Krishna consciousness movement roughed people up a little bit with that conclusion and made themselves into the Jehovah's Witnesses of India. They did so with the best of intentions. My guru didn't want them to do that, but all of us 50 years ago were a little rough around the edges. Some of us thought it through and decided not to keep pushing that kind of Vedanta on people. But for it to land, that was necessary. So I apologize on behalf of all of us who were uh, young and freshly off LSD and uh, <laughs> had a wonderful, amazing guru who be given the, the most amazing knowledge one could be given, but were totally unqualified uh, to represent it to the world. You can understand that's a much more difficult thing. So the reason Sandy and I are teaching and the posture that we're teaching and the reason I'm not wearing orange robes and um, posturing as a Vedic guru is because I want this to be so approachable for everyone that it isn't difficult for you to come. We can laugh about it, but it's the same knowledge. It's the knowledge that you're a true individual and please don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Please keep your true individuality. You don't have to get rid of that part. It isn't your individuality that's been causing the problems. It's just that you came to this place where everything is temporary. That's all. It's not your problem. It's just the nature of the material world. So please don't give up on yourself because your self was associated with that temporariness. And so then that self doesn't have to be aggressive to exist either. Then you can be soft with others and wait for them to be ready to hear about this. And that's the most congruent way to do it because it is about <coughs> beauty shows us love and love and beauty are what we then show through our eyes and our tone of voice and our manner when we bring this kind of knowledge to people when they realize they're not being told what to do, they're not being told what to join, they're not being encroached upon in any way, and rather they're being drawn out, being asked if they would please be the most individual that they could possibly be and shine the light of love that's the gift that every one of us has to give to the world, out into the world. And is there another thing that at these difficult times we can really contribute to the world? Well, our anger and our sarcasm and our hurtful speech and, and other things which are just the disease that that we're seeing. Can we really change the world with those? Not so much. But we really can <coughs> change individuals just by the way we touch them, just by the way we look at them, just by the way we speak to them, just by finding an example of someone who's living this and, and believes it and can explain it. And then it's simpler than we thought. It's not so difficult. It's just that we came here in pursuit of beauty. It was a reflection as it turns out this is the trailer to the movie, and the movie is going to be amazing, and is amazing. And you can go from trailer to movie as soon as you stop being tortured by this misunderstanding of why beautiful things then rot and decompose and appear to go into the ground. It appears the beauty keeps getting destroyed, and when we believe that ritual, we become unhappy. You see? So if you can just get past that, then you can go into the thinking, feeling, and willing processes and use each one up to its correct limit. And then your memory becomes clear and you actually remember past cause and effect. So the way I want to end this is that because we've all got a past, because we've all spent so many lifetimes in pursuit of, so, of all this learning, then it's taken us quite a while to get to the point of this clarity having this conversation. So when you go home, if you can just sort of write down these questions, who am I really? Where did I really come from? Why am I here? What am I trying to get out of being here? How am I in negative response and reaction to being here? What can I do about that? And how can I pursue the beauty that I have been pursuing, but pursue it differently? Pursue it so that I don't set up an impossible consequence that's bound to treat, to teach me pain and suffering. Instead, how could I love and see that beauty without becoming uh, uh, the owner of it or the controller of it? How about if I 
trace it back to its source. That final step as a yoga is called bhakti yoga. It's not emotion only. It's first coming to understand our embodiment and live with it harmoniously. That's yoga. Then it's jnana yoga. It's coming to understand all the categories of things and how this was built, that this is a, something that was built. This is where the scientists are so smart. And then it's coming to be active in doing things within it that help to bring it to this point because it's so easy to destroy it. It's so, so precarious that you start learning how to handle the world in such a way that you bring it back to its balance. You tip it back toward balance rather than destabilizing it just for your selfish needs or desires. Okay? So you don't give up being self, but you give up being selfish in a way that would <coughs> upturn and destroy the world. From that position, then your emotions can blossom and now your pure emotions come out and they become big emotions. And those big emotions are stronger than the negative emotions that comes from everything you see around you dying. Because the wound of that is the wound that we can't get rid of, that keeps hurting us. And so it, it, that's why we get prejudiced against love and that's why we no longer believe it. It becomes a fairy tale. Instead of being the, the fairy tale that we're in and we're trying to find the prince or we're the princess or however you want to see it, but we really are neither male nor female as we are presenting ourselves here. We are atmas in skin, inside clothing. And dehi no smenyata dehi, komaram yovanam jara, tata dehantras praptir, diras tatra namuyate. One who understands that from childhood to youth and then to old age is just like clothes that you buy, wear for a while, and then eventually throw out. And if you don't get any disturbed by that process, that steadiness allows you to understand why we're really here, who we really are. And that's the reward of yoga, is you get to Atma consciousness and you get steady. Then in that steadiness, you can look at beauty steadily and say, I've always been in love with you. I'm madly in love with you. You can look at everyone, see the love in them, but in the just right way, then they get it. My guru looked at me and everyone else in the just right way. For the first time in my life, someone talked directly to my Atma. Someone told me that you're the person inside. And, and that's all that that person telling me that wanted. Didn't want anything back, didn't want anything from me, nothing. Just want you to know you're the person that can't be destroyed. Now, just learn to do that and be that in a more interesting way. Be the most interesting, beautiful being that you can possibly be. Be it bravely, be it with great courage, be it with care and love and attention and affection to everyone around you as much as possible. And then speak the truth in a way that is palatable and that it helps people to come to the conclusion and, and accept it. And gradually, if enough people do this, then the world just by numbers starts to become more reasonable. Really, there is no one person that can do it, but every single one of you can go out from here being this without talking about it at all. Just being, just being beauty and being the beautiful being that you truly are. And I really love this saying, never get in a fight with an ugly person, they have nothing to lose. <laughs> so the, the point here is, take a strategy with people when they're not ready for this. Don't let them make you ugly. Don't be confused why not everyone is understanding this. Just realize that at no time in this world will everyone understand this. That's not possible. This is a school. So if there's a few hundred thousand PhDs or a few million or whatever it is that are on the planet at any given time, then those are the people you're going to high five with. Are we done? Yeah. So this is the PhD program. Vedanta is. And you just entered into that. And if this is exciting to you, then do feel free to continue this as a conversation with us. Because this is why we're doing this. So that it provokes this as a conversation. So that we talk about this back and forth. And you can then pursue it in its sources, in its source material. Because there's no reason you should just believe me. But if you go back to the sources and see that for thousands of years, in India, thousands of amazing beings 
have simply made it their life mission to, to hold this wisdom, to live it and then hold it. Because if you live it, then you think, well, maybe I could hold it, and then you think, maybe I could share it. So that's what that's all we're doing. That's all Sandy and I are trying to do, is hold and then share this beautiful knowledge. Thanks for listening, and now we'll do some Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.